Stay tuned to the end of this video to a word for our patrons. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Let's Look FGO Wanted, the show where we let you know if you want to roll that five star. It's time to talk about our writer who acts like a caster, Taiga Wang. Joining the ranks of our many permanent writers. Yes, this is not a limited unit, funnily enough. And so we'll be talking about that stuff more. In fact, we'll be fishing up some real-life history and folklore, some lore, some mechanics, and more on today's episode, which is hopefully more timely. Though I admit, after writing this script, I feel way more, like, stuffed up and tired than I would have expected, so who knows how timely it is. Anyway, let's get right into the business. So today we're going to talk about Tai Gong Wong, as mentioned before, a strategist and ruler from originally the Shang and later the Zhou Dynasty periods of China. In fact, you know, kind of important to that whole role over there. But first, welcome back to Can Omega Pronounce Chinese Names Right? The answer? No, probably not, though I'm sure I'm as good as I've ever been. And boy, this is important because this guy's got a lot of names. So he's usually styled as Jiang Zia, but also sometimes Lu Shang or Shang Fu. Not sure where that one cropped up. Sources on, like, wikis and stuff are not great at tunneling down why they're written differently, just they are sometimes. He was also posthumously called the Great Duke of Qi, which also probably sometimes is left untranslated as Duke Tai. The title, Tai Gong Wong, it's an epithet, basically. It means Grand Duke's Hope, as Zheng was said to be a sage, prophesied to the kings of Zhou, so they were looking for a guy, and they found him, and they're like, oh, this guy's the hope of the Great Duke. In Japanese, this title is read as Taikobo, so forgive me if I sometimes switch back and forth. But yes, this is the thing with a lot of Chinese servants. Their names are pronounced a different way in Japanese readings, but are meant to be the same name. Anyway, the story of how he got to be a military strategist, as related to the work credited to Zheng in the Six Secret Teachings, is that after receiving divinations that he would meet a great sage, King Wen of Zhou, met Zheng Zia, fishing on a riverbank, and hit him up for some strategy tips, you know, like you do when you see a guy fishing. Impressed by his counsel, because apparently this guy was actually pretty smart, King Wen invited Zhang back to his court. The aforementioned then Six Secret Teachings is a military treatise broken into six sections, which basically discusses statecraft and military strategy in depth, from how to organize your civil government to back up your military, the civil strategy, all the way to what is basically the equivalent of ancient combined arms and special forces, that section's the dog strategy, but it talks about combining the needs of, like, infantry, cavalry, chariots, etc. Picking out elite soldiers, so on and so forth. It's considered one of the seven military classics of China. It's also somewhat unique in that it is kind of explicitly written from a revolutionary's perspective, since the Zhou were aiming to overthrow the Shang Dynasty. So, Yang served as a general and advisor for King Wen, and then his son King Wu. He cautioned patience and waited for an opportune moment to revolt against the Shang, and this eventually led to a Zhao decisive victory in the Battle of Muye. Sorry, pause to sneeze off mic there for a second. Where was I? Yes, okay. So, uh, they defeated the Shang forces, and King Zhou of Shang... Yeah, I know, it's a bit confusing. It's written with different characters in Chinese. Anyway, he's said to have burned down his palace and himself aside, and his queen, Lady Daji, was captured by King Wu and executed on Jiang Zia's orders. Lady Daji is enough of a character to be her own story or separate video, but the short version is she's considered to be the reason for the Shang's moral corruption. She was a beautiful woman, the King Zhou neglected his statecraft to ingratiate himself with her, and then he contrived many tortures and executions for her apparent amusement. And also she did a few amusements herself. Later she was mythologized as being possessed by a nine-tailed fox spirit, so that will come back if you didn't know that part already. After the Zhou dynasty was established, he remained a minister for their government and was considered the master of strategy, and he remained loyal to the capital during the Rebellion of Three Guards sometimes later, kind of cementing his legacy as all-around cool guy. Zhang Zia was allegedly a forward thinker in political philosophy. He believed that a nation's power was derived from its people's prosperity, that a nation would be worse off if officials lined their pockets at the expense of the common man, and the ruling principle in nation building is to love its people. He's also associated with a few Chinese proverbs. I'm not going to begin to say that I can get the subtleties across to you. It's a specific form of, like, style of proverb in Chinese. But he's a big deal. The Tang Dynasty later sanctioned a temple dedicated to him, which is placing him on par almost with Confucius. Now, in later history, Zhang Zia was mythologized as a Taoist sage using arts he learned in the Kunlun Mountains to defeat supernatural foes. He was considered a Taoist immortal, and so on and so forth. So, you know, lots of big legends. 
a lot, but not all of this work comes from the novel The Investiture of the Gods, Feng Shen Yan Yi, which is a 16th century Chinese novel which romanticizes the overthrow of the Shang with mythological elements. It's credited to the author Xu Zhonglin. I think that's how that works. To give a grossly oversimplified summary to a literal hundred chapter story, the plot kicks off when King Zhou gets horny for a statue of the goddess Nua, which offends her and has her prophesy the downfall of the dynasty, and she sends three malicious spirits, a nine-tailed fox, a nine-headed pheasant, and a jade pipa, to ensure the process and make sure that, you know, he's a real bad man and things go badly. Zhang Zia is a major character in the novel. He is a Taoist sage from Kunlun. He's armed by his master on the orders of the Jade Emperor with a list of gods to be invested, deified, hence the title, which he must cultivate. And then a job to ensure that the Shang must fall, which puts him at odds with Lady Daji, who's gone a little bit off the reservation. Since this is historical fiction, Zhang Zia succeeds. He defeats Daji with the immortal beheading flying knife, which is a sword which is alive and has eyes and wings, oddly enough, and promotes 365 major gods and a boatload of lesser gods and immortals, basically setting up a big staffing increase for the Celestial Bureau, which is kind of the other meta point of the novel besides the actual historical rotation. Expect the investiture to keep coming back a few times in the future, by the way. It has a fuck ton of characters, uh, including this is the source of some of the antics we get of the servant, Nesha, and is the basis for more future servants. It's going to come back, so keep your eyes peeled. Now, our lore section is going to be a little shorter than usual because, for the most part, fate cleaves pretty close to at least the fantastical version in investiture. Tai Gong Wong is a writer, not a caster, which he claims is unfortunate because if he was a caster, he'd qualify for a grand caster easily, according to his basic profile. Unsure on the fact check here. I don't see that he has the required clairvoyant abilities, but who knows. That said, he does make sense as a writer. He is a military strategist with knowledge of various tactics, including cavalry, and he does possess a divine beast noble phantasm. Oh god, I wrote this down, but I'm like, not even sure. Sibu Zhang? There's an X in it, but I'm pretty sure that's more of a xiang, sha kind of sound. Anyway, it basically looks like a dragon deer. You can see it in one of his ascension arts. In-game, he uses it for, like, attack animations and stuff, but he can't invoke its full anti-army powers, but it is an actual noble phantasm, which would qualify him as a writer. He says it's not a dragon king, but it has all the abilities a dragon king would. It can, like, shapeshift, fly, magical barriers, fire breath. But... He does also totally qualify as a caster because he is a Taoist immortal and he has a philosophy key, which is basically the equivalent of a magic crest in Chinese-style magecraft in the lore. And it's a key from the Age of Gods, so it's pretty strong at that. He has a very diverse and potent ability of magecraft. Also, I don't always comment on a servant's visual design, but I will do a fun note here. So in history, Zhang Zia is said to already be an old man when he meets the King of Zhou, and you can see the alleged portrait of him I have used as the bed image for this section. And in Vestiture, he's described as being 72 years old already when he leaves Kunlun, but also he's an immortal, so he's described as basically looking like a 20-something in the novel, so his character design does actually fit in. Unfortunately, why we're going to have to cut this pretty short, apart from our other cleaving, is that any other specific lore discussion is really trending into his role in the Tunguska story, which we're all about to experience, so just... Keep watching and reading for all that. That means it's time to talk about mechanics. Okay, so our boy here is an SSR writer. He's kind of in the media and attacking HP for that class. There are a lot of SSR writers, so kind of makes sense. He is QQAAB with average hit counts and above average NP gain, though not super high above average, you know. Also very funny given his caster comment that he has, a, you know, a deck that is pretty at home on writers. His NP is incredibly straightforward. It's AoE, it's quick, it deals bonus damage to enemies with the Divine Trait, and reduces their quick resistance for three turns based on overcharge. So, intended for some loopability, or wombo combos. His first skill gives the party 10-15% to 15 up on quick attack and NP damage for three turns, a pretty comprehensive buff. His second skill hits all enemies with one turn of skill seal and buffs his damage specifically versus Demonic and Divine Trait enemies by 30-50% to 50 for three turns. His final skill is a 20-30% battery for himself, and a 10-20% battery for the whole party. This includes himself, so he has a functional 50% battery with this, but also your other party members do get a 20, which is nice. Not a lot of farmers have that AoE support. Spoilers for later, I guess. Anyway, his only passive skill is writing A+. Seems a little lean, but, you know, it's good. It juices his primary uh, attack card. Also, by the way, his special damage uh, append skill is 
anti-foreigner. Gee, I wonder why. Anyway, Taikobo is a very straightforward servant. For a guy claiming to be a Grand Caster candidate, he's probably not as meta-revolutionary as our other Grand Qualifying servants. He's still a very solid unit. He has an AoE with several steroids. This makes him a pretty ideal farmer, and he is dual Scotty compatible, TM. However, he also has use in story and challenge content because he can hit some pretty peak damage with those trait mods if his skills are maxed out, regardless of class advantage, though obviously that helps a lot. His buffs being mostly team wide also means he can work great as a semi support for more focused damage dealers, so you can slot him in the rotation to clear adds or just give the buffs to your party and then, you know, use him to soften him up. Get some free overcharge that way, for instance, if you lead with his NP. The main thing he lacks, I would say, is solid utility or defensive options. He's pretty focused on damage, and a one-turn skill seal won't buy you too much relief. That can be helpful, especially in challenge-type quests, where enemies can have some very annoying skill sets. But it's no, you know, supplement for, like, because I'm going to mention, uh, as a fellow AoE writer, Odysseus, for instance, has an invul, and there's other servants that have some pretty heavy blocks, so keep that in mind. For Team Comp, I did mention he is Scotty compatible, and he probably works with other AoE hitters like Odysseus. Odysseus also has some, you know, team-wide quick support, so you can do some fun mix-up there. Or you can stick with other supports in the quick genre, like Osakabe Hime, or even just as a support rider, Sima Yi. If you want him to use as a semi-support, he's probably best paired with another powerhouse anti-divine or anti-demonic unit, especially if they are already quick-focused, like Skahak or Okuni. You know, use him to soften the way so that your single target can really get in there. For CEs, you're probably going to be focused on NP damage and quick up. He brings the trait pain enough on his own. There are a fine selection of Sakura themed CEs like One Summer and Cherry Icicle. For the quick, if you want just the attack, you can do Golden Sumo. I would recommend those genre of CEs because he does have a 50% battery, so 50% charges are pretty good. That does free you up to save your Scotty batteries for later if you need them for looping. If you're just gonna go for the double Scotty farm, no thought. You can just go all in on something like Black Grail, though. Now, Taikobo is gonna be a bonus servant with bonus points and everything in Tunguska. He'll also be a bonus servant next Halloween. Halloween Rebellion of 108 people. And the next, uh, the following years, I should say. I wrote this confusingly in my notes. The following years, Grail Front, uh, White Castle, Black Castle, which takes place in the Halloween time slot. And again, very straightforward. Not much else to discuss there. Find an enemy that's demonic or divine, throw him at him, he'll do good. His ascension mats are pretty normal, shouldn't be too crazy. But the skills can get a little costly, which is a little rough because you're going to want to max a couple of these pretty fast, the battery especially. He's going to need 15 pages, 15 demon lamps, and 10 egg per skill. That shouldn't be crazy, but it does, you know, add up over time, so you may want to be conscious of this before you go all in on there. Now, this boy's going to have a lot of raid ups, which is weird because I mentioned this at the top, but he is permanent. He has a banner both on Tunguska's release and when it becomes a main interlude in about six months. He seems to have also basically slotted into Halloween. He's got a banner next Halloween. That'll be in the upcoming year, 2024. And then, as I mentioned, the Grail Front the year after, 2025 at this point, which happens during the Halloween time slot. So he's got banners around those times. He's also a permanent male unit, so expect to see him every White Day rotation as well. And obviously, if you don't understand how permanent units work, once his initial banner ends, he will just be added to the general summon pool at all times as a non-limited SSR. So, obviously, I've mentioned this, you know, on Raid Up, I went super in the tank, 80-pack and everything on Odysseus, and did not get him when his uh, first banner dropped. And, you know, I did get him later, I think, on, like, a White Day Raid Up some or something. But uh, permanent units are not guaranteed but it does make it possible to catch them randomly at any time, so just keep all that in mind. But yeah, that's all we got for today. He's an in-depth, interesting man, but he's got a lot of story to unfold, and his mechanics, like I said, very straightforward. So I'll let you have the hook. Happy raiding, kids. We'll skedaddle on out of here. So if you're watching this video on YouTube, give us a like, leave a comment, subscribe for more, ring the bell, join the channel membership, support us on Patreon so you can get the episode early. Speaking of our patrons, I would like to remind you this episode is brought to you by all our lovely patrons, with a special shout-out to Adam DeHarp, Blacklist OG, Call Me Zed, Carlos Dragon, Flightless Ice Spirit, Jeremy Vasquez, JDV9000, Jesse the Fay, Jonathan Sandoval, Chris Starlight, Legendary Ball Center, Liam Kessler, Regent Raptor, Rise of Kenji, Rogue Robin, Charvor, Sean Pryor, some guy named Bob, Varen the Crow. If you like what we do and want to see us do more, consider supporting us on Patreon.